Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Shu. Today is another episode in the conversation series of the podcast, and we get the pleasure of sitting down and talking with Andrew Phillips. He is an emergency physician. He's also board certified in critical care and spends half of his time in the intensive care unit. And he is the founder and creator of EM Coach, an artificial intelligence platform for resident and physician education and continuing medical education. He is a fascinating person, and I can't wait for you to hear the interview. Before we start, I want to remind you that ebmedicine.net is your source for continuing medical education for both adult and pediatric emergency medicine and urgent care medicine. There are three articles published every month in those three journals, Emergency Medicine Practice, Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice, and Evidence-Based Urgent Care. That's lots of CME, four hours per article, so many important topics, and all available to you inside the EB Medicine mobile app at the point of care. And now, on to Dr. Phillips. My name is Andrew Phillips. I am an EM intensivist. I work both in the ED and the ICU, and I'm the founder and the editor-in-chief of EM Coach. And I currently work in the community. It gives me a little more time to work on EM Coach. I split my time between the ED and the ICU. Kind of fun fact, I work in a rural uh, ER, and then on the other side of things in the ICU, I work in a tertiary care center running our ECPO program. So I get to have a little bit of view of of both sides and definitely doing the rural emergency medicine keeps things real. I, I enjoy that time a lot. Now, that's an interesting combination, actually, as a side note, you're you're <laughs> in two different hospitals in the same city. This is like the, the rural side is how far away from your tertiary practice? Uh, a little more than an hour, depending on traffic, hour to hour and a half. It gets rural very quickly. So the main, the mothership hospital is where all the tertiary care stuff goes. It's the only level one trauma center in the area. And then it gets rural about 30 minutes out from there. And then you drive in an hour. And I'm curious, does that make transfers to your tertiary care center a lot easier if you're the oh intensivist at that hospital? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> it, it admittedly it very much. Oh, I make sure they know who it is calling because I know them from the ICU, right? I know all the specialists. Very, very helpful. Yes. <laughs> but awesome. one of the reasons I did it when I first, and I asked her that specifically, it wasn't in any way forced upon me or, or whatever. And it wasn't one of those, well, you can do this if you do that. I, I specifically asked for it. I, I grew up in this area and you know, I feel like at the, on the academic side and the big tertiary care centers, all those resources are available to you at any time of the day. I have a surgeon, I have nephrology, I have all of that available any time of the day. And it's, it's been very helpful to me being, uh, it's, it's a one person shop, like over that ED, it's, it's just us, no one around. There is no backup there. Even some periods of time where we don't have radiology reading films for us for a few hours over the, the weekend nights. And I think it just, for me, it is a constant reminder when I get a call for a transfer and I'm at the mothership, I just say, yeah, wherever they're calling from, they don't have the same resources. And the best thing for the patient is to say yes and take the patient and provide the resources that you have. I feel like sometimes we can get complacent with what we have at the tertiary centers. So for me personally, that's, that's a good way to keep grounded in reality of what tough job it is in those small rural places. It's a top gig. And I'm curious, so you don't do any emergency department shifts at the tertiary care center. You're exclusively ICU there? That's correct. I mean, I know them well. We hang out whenever, but that's pretty cool. That's got to be a very unique practice design by itself, really. I can't think I've talked to anyone else. Well, I don't think there are that many people who do both emergency medicine and critical care, but to do them at separate locations is quite interesting. Is that something you just wanted to do, or how did you develop the relationship with the rural hospital exactly? I wanted to do the rural hospital one. So in this area where I grew up, um, I, I knew folks from there and I had friends from there. I was really involved in Boy Scouts growing up. And so that particular council spanned all across this rural area. So I did grow up in that central area with a higher population, but really got to know folks and have some uh, enduring friends from that region. It was further away and just got to realize how resources were disproportionately dispersed in the different areas. And so mm -hmm. when I heard they were looking for a few extra shifts, so the folks there could take a little bit of vacation time and the case, because the way I had, they had it set up, uh, those folks are on for 12 hour shifts, seven days a week, and then they didn't have people to fill in. 
other than vacation time, it was seven on, seven wow. off, seven on, seven off. And so when I heard they were looking for just a little bit of help, a few shifts a month, and yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to go out there and help. And so I, a lot of it had to do with just growing up, knowing the area, knowing the people. I enjoy the work and it, it keeps, like I said, it keeps me humble and it keeps me on my toes. So for a while there was no OB backup and I had a breach delivery that I had to do on my own and that's rural emergency medicine. Wow. Yeah. That's the scary stuff for sure. I definitely do appreciate all of the backup we get at our referral center and all of the rapid access to the multiple specialties. It's something that if you don't talk to people who work elsewhere, you can certainly take for granted. And after a while, dealing with personalities and things, it can get quite frustrating. But certainly talking to people who work on the rural side who have no access to anyone at any time, it can certainly make you appreciate it a lot more. Tell me, what city are you in? So I work in Edinburgh for the tertiary center and then real grand city is where the other hospital is. Wow. Fantastic. So tell me about EM coach. Now you've been doing that for how long? We launched almost four years ago now, ASAP four years ago. It's a council of residency directors and emergency medicine member benefit. And so all the programs have access to this for a, a nominal, really nominal fee if they want it. And we have a slightly more than a third of the programs actually in the country subscribed to us. And we've been a core member benefit now for three, two and a half years this is the third year we've been doing it and continue to pick up programs and people are seeing the alternative. It's, it's a little bit of a part of what we've seen is people have had to adjust their expectations because they're so used to just having a QBank. And we're more than that, we're a QBank in addition to the review book and the lecture series. And particularly those programs that use foundations have found that it's a perfect package because foundations doesn't really matter which source you use for a given topic. It just, you know, today's upper GI bleed and tomorrow's lower GI bleed or whatever. And so they'll have their Rosen's pages they have for you or Tintinale's or a blog or it doesn't matter the source. And so because we have it all packaged together, plus program directors are able to keep track of what people are doing. And so it's very easy for the asynchronous learning with the individualized learning for the one hour that they get. And we just spit out at the end of the year, if they want it, a, uh, a list of the total residents and how many hours they did and it's done deal. Really easy to show during the reviews. And you are the creator of EM coach. And is there more behind the scenes? How big is the team? Yeah, I started it. I was a junior high teacher in a former life. And so I have a master's in education. And when I went through and did the boards, I saw what review materials are out there. I thought, man, somebody can do this a lot better. And so that's how it came to be. My wife is really into tech. So she, for example, ran Walmart's Black Friday sale online. That was her wow. that ran it. And so we got together and she did the tech side of this. And I did the medical side along with a lot of friends. So we have several deputy editors, it's Christina Shenvey, Becky Higby. Christina Shenvey is out at uh, UNC. Becky Higby trained with me at Stanford, and she's a community doc now. Patrick Malloy over at Emory, and Nick Cluster, who is back in the community as well. He was at Iowa for a while. In addition to a lot of people who are writing questions, editing the textbook for us and things like that. Now, one of the things that's unique to us, which was surprising to me that this is not a requirement for everybody else, Every piece of content on here is written by a board certified emergency physician. We don't have medical students. We don't have residents. You can't be a similar specialty because I'm adamant that if we're telling you that we're preparing you for the boards that we darn well should have already passed the boards ourselves. And that was, that was really important to me. I will say, so we had a stati PhD statistician look over the stats page and we had a pharmacist look over the pharmacology because, you know, who doesn't want a pharmacist looking over their pharmacology? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was going to say that the artificial intelligence part of it is unique. You mentioned earlier the question bank and the training in emergency medicine up to this point being, you know, if you're reading a book, you're doing a series of questions. If you're doing some kind of peer review product, you're looking at a set of questions as well, maybe with an explanation or some link up to provided extra information. But the artificial intelligence piece of this is something that tailors the curriculum to the person who's actually involved in the study. Is that right? That's right. The individual, that precise same person. Now, we do have it so that faculty can apply that algorithm to, let's say, if they're doing group learning, small group learning, they can apply the algorithm to more than one person. But its strength really is on that one individual. It's funny. It's been a, a bit of a, of a cult following 
So when people are willing to try, it's, it's funny that I think, and not just in AI for education, but in any of the AI, there's a little bit of trepidation. What exactly is the computer doing? I'm not really going to let the car yeah. drive itself. And I'm not really going to let the program diagnose with the imaging or whatever, right? There's a little trepidation. I totally get it. People have a, a Robbie the Robots kind of uh, mentality of what this is. But I would liken it to an EKG readout. And that would be the old school idea of, of, of AI. It's, it's a very, very complicated algorithm, right? But still an algorithm. And just like an EKG machine is going to 95% of the time catch things just the way you want them and whatever, it's a support structure, right? And a lot of times people tend to look at what the readout on the EKG machine has to bolster what they're doing. It's funny when people are willing to give it a try, then they tend to go feet first. So of the people who will use the AI, they'll make tens and tens and tens of tests, and that's what they tend to use. What's interesting about it is, so it has been remarkably helpful for those who are on individualized learning plan and remedial learning opportunities for residents mm. at programs. So that is by far when we talk to faculty, how are they using us? So not all programs make assignments all the time. It, kind of varies. Some of them just let residents here, here's your, here are your resources, go for it. I would just expect you to do well in the ITE and you do you kind of thing. And some programs do assignments. And, and yeah. even if they don't make assignments, what we've heard time and time again from programs is that it's extraordinarily helpful for the remedial education plans because it forces you to study the things that are your weak spots. And it's hard. It's painful. I'm not going to lie. Like mm. instead of being able to study those things you already know, which is a, a tendency. If, if I had my druthers, it would just be cardiac, and thoracic all day long. Great, right? That's my jam. And then I hit a toxicology question and I'm like, oh, shoot, one eight 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 eight. right? I'm calling my doc <laughs> center. That's, that's the answer. Where's that number? And that's what the, that's the AI does. It drives down and it forces you, not just your worst subject, but in a linear fashion, your worst subjects, plural. And it also has spaced repetition built into it. For those who are unfamiliar with it, it's a concept of spacing out in a progressively longer period of time coming back to a topic and relearning something. So maybe you come back to it one week later and then one month later and then six months later and it solidifies it early on. That's all built into this algorithm. And so when people try it out, their scores tank in the very beginning because all of a sudden they're forced to emphasize those topics they don't do well. If you're willing to gut mm. it out a little bit, such as when faculty are giving us these AI assignments, all of a sudden, then when you take a step back and take a smattering of all topics, well, now you've been hitting so hard all your weak spots. Once you add in the things you were already good at, you'll see your score just skyrocket. And so you have to get past that mental part of, I mean, it's just like, you know, if, if you go to the gym and you like your trainer, you don't have a good trainer. Right, mm. like you got to you got to get through <laughs> that that pain, right? If they're not making you you feel the pain, they're yeah. not actually getting a gain out of it. Same thing. Now, the algorithm, the use of artificial intelligence for education is not new in education in general. I mean, this is a new application of it in emergency medicine. But were you the creators of artificial intelligence in education? Or was this something that you kind of looked around? And like you mentioned, you, you were a teacher before. Is this something that was in use when you were teaching and you thought, hey, there's a better application for this in emergency medicine as well? Uh, that was not. So we did. We created this particular algorithm and intelligence for this program. And here's where the others had failed. If you look into AI and medical education, and I'm going to focus on that because there is some and trying to get into other secondary sort of things. But even when you're talking about AI and medicine with Watson and all that, and let's be honest, mm. the money in medicine, general healthcare, it's way more, right? Than medical education. And even they're struggling, right? To make it really something that is usable and applicable. And so the development and such for medical education where it has run into problems is that they're trying to make an exact prescription as a back and forth with kind of an AI of what the person is thinking and drilling down into the, the thought process in order to do a back and forth kind of a conversation. And there were a few articles that took an extraordinary amount of money, an extraordinary amount of time to do a single topic or a single question. So the one that's coming to the top of my head, oh, I think it was like, 10 years ago now, maybe it was pre COVID In my mind. That's all I remember now is pre COVID <laughs> and after COVID. So a pre COVID article that was on heart failure 
And that's all it was. It was a single question just on heart failure and basically built kind of like, um, uh, you know, back in the days of like, you know, Tom Hanks and big, where you yeah. could like talk to the computer and the wizard and the wizard wants you to do whatever. Right. So back yeah. and forth, kind of like that, but it's not feasible for every single topic. And so I'd hearken back again to the EKG readout for ours that what we decided to focus on is using the algorithm to determine what your weakness is and then just give you our recommended content, but you're going to have to work through where you maybe didn't understand it, which most people by this time can. If you're a physician by this point, you've done med school, you can work through your misunderstanding if we present the other material. But that's also part of why every time that in that coach run, when it runs through the questions and everything, it's not just giving you a series of questions. It also gives you a textbook section to be reading and a lecture, part of a lecture, just a snippet. That way we are providing different venues in a different approach. The textbook was written by someone who didn't do the lecture, vice versa. Maybe the question was written by a different person who didn't do the lecture. So you're hearing it's three different in the question explanation, plus the review book, plus the lectures. You're now hearing three different approaches to the same concept and it works. People get it. And so it's a, it's a workable AI. And that artificial intelligence is providing the structural framework for your education. You mentioned you still have to do the learning on your own. Essentially, it's using the resources within the program to learn the material. But the overlay of artificial intelligence is really helping you identify your weakness, fill out all of those areas, and make sure you're progressing in all areas and not missing something. Right. It structures it so you're more successful and more efficient. It tells you what you need to look at, how you need to look at it. And part of that too, being the space repetition, right? Because we'll go back to my toxicology weakness and it, it really is like toxicology and hematology. Give me, give me an LVAN, give me an ECMO any day over a hematology question. And so it'll come back to that, right? So let's say I spend a long time really getting to know Coombs and forcing out, you know, all of the issues that I have with the hematology questions. It, I will start to forget that, say, you know, a month later, right? So it will automatically come back. So it's very much a scaffolding for you. Hmm. Fascinating. With a lot of them, this really was built, to my knowledge, the only program that was built really with educational theory and best evidence out there because of the masters that I had when I went through this. I, for example, I, one of my favorite examples when people are like, oh, you know, how, what do you mean that apply? You applied all that and what does it really make a difference? Most people don't realize that, for example, when you pull up a Word doc, right, you may have noticed that something like seven or eight years ago, the default went from Times New Roman to Arial or Calibri, one of the, one of the two, right? It kind of changes. I think Arial may be in PowerPoint, but anyway, they're, they're sans serif fonts. So the serif is the little extra doohickey on the end of a Times New Roman font. And so there are serif fonts and sans serif fonts. And in fact, it turns out that you can read for longer and read more when on a screen, not on paper, doesn't matter on paper, but on a screen, retain more and for a longer period of time information in a sans serif font. And so we have Verdana throughout our entire site because it was the best studied of the different fonts. So even down to the font type that we used, that went into the site. Everything that could be possibly evidence-based is. We want you to get the most out of the time. And you say evidence-based, we're not talking about medicine, but you're talking about the evidence base for education theory in this, sen in this sense. Education and some education theory, and a lot of it, it has actually been in the medical educational literature. I mean, we published our review on the topic in AEM, and so, yeah, some of it is in the medical education literature. It kind of depends on some of the more fundamental things do come from general education, but we'll look at the APA and things like that. If it's applicable, then we used it. That was one of the advantages of taking all those extra classes. I understand. I mean, education is such a mixing pot, right? You have a little bit of psychology. You have a little bit of the general education. There's a lot, certainly, that we can learn from pedagogy with the earlier education, right? Some of the Vygotsky and all those sort of folks. Uh, that can apply to us just as well. And so, yeah, that all that was built into the site from the ground up. It was very intentional. Blended learning is in here. I mean, that's part of the fact of having the lectures in addition to the textbook and the questions, right? Changing up the way in which you study. It's deeper than just a cue make. And that was very intentional because at some point, the explanations only teach you so much. And you can whip through questions, but people tend to get the same questions wrong and the same questions right because an explanation can only go so far. 
And so that's why one of the favorite features that we have is at the end of every question, every question, there are two buttons that say C related textbook section and C related video or lecture section. And it takes you to that section of the lecture or that section of the textbook, not the whole thing, just related to that one particular topic. So let's say you get to the bottom, you're like, man, I still, I just don't understand bottom of a question. And you say, I don't understand hypocalcemia anymore. Now there's that quick link button that opens up a new tab and now takes you to listen to that four minute lecture specifically on hypocalcemia to take a deeper understanding. So the next time that question comes up, you can get it right. So that's part of blended learning that was built into it as well. And the resources, the written information and these lectures, you had to create these or where did you, where did these come yep. from? Yep. From scratch. That's all us. So these are folks wow. from all around the country who put it together one by one, uh, chapter by chapter. And we followed the reason there are 20 chapters is that we followed the model of the practice of emergency medicine. So some people ask, why don't you have a peds chapter? It's because that model, if, if folks are not familiar with it, the model of the practice of emergency medicine is the document that was created and signed on to by CORD, SAEM, uh, ASAP, AEM, RSA, I think ACOEP was part of it as well. All the different EM organizations, and I'm missing a few, but just you know, all the organizations have agreed that these are the topics that all emergency physicians should know. And it's built in 20 chapters and well, they're telling us what's on the test. It's an open document. It's, it's nothing secret. It's the backbone for how they make the exam. And it's the backbone for how we built EM coach. So we just took the topics and wrote about them. And that seems to have worked incredibly well. And today, if someone wanted to go take a look at EM coach, they could go and see it on the web and read more about it at what address? Yeah, so it's www.emcoach.org. And we offer a free trial subscription to it that includes one chapter, which has the questions of the textbook and the lecture. And you're welcome to take a look at that and peruse it. And one of the things that sets us apart as well is our pro subscription is five years. So it was just one year, like typical for folks. But with my EM cert now, people want a little more time to put together their modules. And so we did not increase the price at all. We just extended the subscription to be five years because you shouldn't have to be paying for us every single year when you're doing one module. You have five years to do the modules, we'll give you five years of EM coach. Yeah, and that is actually a good point as well. This is not a product that's only tailored to residents or people in training. It can be used for continuing medical education and maintaining your board certification and maintaining your level of education kind of throughout your career. Absolutely. And in fact, I think it's the best one for the my insert because we are launching in about a month here, around three or four weeks, we're already going through the testing a search function. And so when you're studying and using our textbook, you can use the same textbook you've been studying with to use as open book for the actual my EM cert. And so why would you use two different sources? You've already, you know where things are, you know which things you highlighted and such. You can use the exact same resource and it's in outline format. So you're not having to dig through the depths of articles or uh, you know, up to date's a, a great resource when you have lots and lots and lots and lots of time to read, but not when you're trying to whip through the test really fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent point. When people need, when people sign up or register for EM Coach, it's available on what kind of platforms? How do they interact with it? Oh, yeah. So we have the most comprehensive mobile apps of any of the programs out there because we have the review book and the lectures alongside the questions as well. And no one else has all of those available on the mobile app. So iOS and Android, both those are available. And of course, on any of the web browsers as well, we even, as crazy as it sounds, the developers laughed at us, but we even have optimized this for Internet Explorer, knowing full well that not only my hospital, but I know yours too, is still operating on Internet Explorer in the 1990s. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so you can use EM coach on your hospital computer with an old fashioned Internet Explorer without a problem. And they really did. The developers were like, no, no, no one uses that anymore. And I was, guys, I trust me. And it, 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 it's about 12 to 15% of anyone who logs in is logging in on Internet Explorer. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? But completely not surprising because, yes, our <laughs> hospitals are still in the dark ages on a lot of things. Well, great. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me. It's a very unique 
service and a very unique approach to medical education and as a boat that we're all in and swimming through. It's cool to have another resource that takes a different spin to things. I really like that idea. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for the podcast. Don't forget ebmedicine.net, your source for both adult and pediatric emergency medicine and evidence-based urgent care medicine, continuing medical education, and the mobile app. Just search EB Medicine in the Apple or Google Play stores. Until next time, I'm Sam Mishu. Be safe, everyone.